Lord this morning. If you will, find some folks. Tell them how glad you are to see them here this morning. That's always a, uh, uh, a great event, so I hope you'll make plans to be here for those uh, items this afternoon. Inside your bulletin, you'll find a connection card that's like this here. hope you'll take a moment to uh, fill out the front side and on the back side to write down your prayer concerns. 
because we want to uh, uh, pray for those things that are on your heart. If you'll do that, place it in the offering plate. The ushers will bring them up at the end of the service. We'll pray over those. Uh, we pray over all of these at our staff meeting. we we'll make a prayer list and hand it out to the whole church on Wednesday. So if you'll take a moment to do that. For those of you that are visiting with us today, thank you for coming to be with us. Let me ask you to fill out your connection card and hold on to it. And then at the end of the service, if you'll come over here to the hospitality table and bring me your card, I'll turn it in so it's prayed over. But I have an information packet and a gift I'd like to give you, so if you'll take a minute on your way out and see me at the hospitality table. Well, to see uh, God's favor and blessing this morning, uh, as we worship Him. You would join your heart with mine as we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to pause and say we love You. We want to say thank You, Lord, for loving us. And Father, I want us to uh, begin this morning by saying, God, if there's anything in our hearts, anything in our lives, God, that are displeasing, and Lord, that You might move it, that you might cleanse it. Father, that we might enter into your presence today and give you glory and honor and praise that is worthy of who you are and what you have done. Lord, may everything that happens here today have the mercy and grace of God upon us. For we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
He's always there. We may think we have no friends. Our God is faithful. Let's put our hands together.
all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. The Word of God tells us that one man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Let us pray.
pray for us, okay?
church. Amen. One of these days, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Amen. that Jesus Christ is Lord. Look inside your bulletin, you'll find an outline of today's message. I'm going to ask all that are able to please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. First Chronicles 29 and verse 3. David, King David is speaking. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own, of gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. Matthew's Gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In Ephesians 5.25, the Apostle Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will breathe life into these words in our hearts. Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church today. Then God give us faith and obedience to obey the call of the Holy Spirit upon our life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Gallup poll did a survey in America to find out what does America, what do Americans think they need. And here are the results. Number one, the need for shelter and food. Number two, the need to believe life is meaningful and has a purpose. The need for a sense of community and deeper relationships. Need to be appreciated and respected. The need to be listened to and to be heard. The need to feel that one is growing in faith. And I looked at that list and I thought to myself, where else can you better find those needs met than in the church of Jesus Christ? I want to say to you this morning that I love the church. I want to say this morning that I love this church. And I do so not because I'm the pastor. I want you to know the church is not my idea. I want you to know the church is Jesus' idea. It's not Paul's idea, the apostles' idea, the disciples' idea. It is Jesus' idea. Jesus said, I will build my church. You understand that God's plan for all eternity is the church. God's plan to change the world is not government. It's not education. It's not Wall Street. God's plan to change the world is the church. You understand that everything that you do in this life is going to burn up one day, but what you do for God is going to last forever. And so today I want to share with you what it means to love the church. Number one, Notice here, the church needs your loving affection. Verse Chronicles 29, verse 3, King David said, Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own, of gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the house of my God, I will give it to the house of my God. I want you to underline that word there, devotion. The King James Version translates that word affection. The New American Standard Version translates that same word delight. The Contemporary English Version 
translates that word love. So let's put them all together. What King David is saying is God's house. I love it. I delight in it. I have affection for it. And I am devoted to it. Now my question is, can you say the same thing? Can you say, I love God's house? Can you say, I love God's church? Can you say, I am devoted to God's house, God's church? Notice here, David says, I will love my church sacrificially. In 1 Chronicles 22, David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, You shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son and I will be his father. See, David built a great big palace for himself. And he looked out and he says, You know what? I, I, I should be living in this place and God not have a place better than I. I want to build God a house of worship. And so he set out to do that and he starts gathering all the building materials. But then God says to him, David, you're not going to build it. Your son's going to build it. So what does he do? He gets mad. He goes over to the corner and he pouts and says, All right, God, if that's what you want, let him do it. I'll have no part of it. No, that's not what he did. What did he do? He got all the materials together. And when he got all the materials together, he gave of all of his personal wealth. If you took how much it was worth in that day and you assigned the value to this day, it'd be worth $10 billion. Can you imagine if Donald Trump would say, Hey, I'm going to give all that I've ever earned in my whole life to Anthony Grove Baptist Church. Yeah. Now, it'd be great if Donald did that. But what are you going to do? David says, I will never see it built. I will never worship in it. But I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that it's there for my children and my grandchildren. What do you do? Do you love God's church sacrificial? Well, notice here, you can give without loving. But you cannot love without giving. That is, I can give stuff and not love you, but if you love somebody or something, you're going to give. Notice here in Ephesians 5.25, I love how the message uh, translates this. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives. Women, can I get an amen for that? Amen. Yeah. Exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked... By giving, not by getting. So let me ask you, do you love God's church? Is it marked by giving or is it marked by getting? Do you come to the house of God for what you get or do you come to the house of God for what you give? Listen, the Bible says that Jesus loved the church that He gave to the church. A lot of folks say they love the church with their mouth. But their life just doesn't back it up. Amen. <laughs> Several years ago, I sat down and penned a letter. Gave it to our uh, administrative assistant. And I said, this year when you do our annual contributions, I'd like for you to stick this letter in there. Alright, I wrote the letter. The secretary puts it in there. The treasurer keeps up with what you give. I don't know what you give. I don't touch the money. I don't count the money. Okay? And so when you get a letter that says, thank you for giving, it shows what you give. I didn't see the other part. I don't know what you give. That's when you and God. But one fellow got his letter and he called me up and he said, Pastor, I appreciate that letter. It really blessed my heart. I said, well, thank you. I Thank you for giving to the Lord and for God's work. He said, but when I saw the second part, I felt ashamed. 
I said, what do you mean the second part? He said, the part that I gave. I said, oh, well, that's between you and God. He said, Pastor, I couldn't believe that all year all I gave was $20. Now get this, this man was a Sunday school teacher. So he stands up every week in Sunday school and teaches the Word of God. He has a full-time job. His wife had a full-time job. They had two children. They were involved in every aspect of the church. But do the math, folks. That's less than a dime a week. <laughs> but I love the church. Just not true. Just not true. Because you see, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. So let me ask you a question. Do you support this church financially? And if so, why? I have, a, I have a place you can write down why. And Ashley got the PowerPoint. She said, Preacher, you left one of the lines blank. I said, no, the people are going to write down their answer. I don't know what their answer is. I know what my answer is. My answer is that I support the, the church financially because I love Jesus and I love His church. That's what it says in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Alright, so why, why does God give? He gives because He loves. We give, why? Because we love Jesus and we love His church. Remember, the church is Jesus' idea. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the flock of God. The church is the family of God. Pastor went out to a certain farmer and kept inviting him to come to church. Old farmer said, I'm never coming to your church, Pastor. But what the pastor of church anyhow is Jesus. Jesus bought it with His blood. He said, I want you to know I live better than most of the people who come to your church. So one day, the pastor goes down to the farm and looks around and finds the sickliest, the puniest, the scrawniest pig that he could find. And he says to the farmer, I'm going to buy that pig right there. Well, the farmer just smiled and he thought, oh man, I'll be glad to sell him this pitiful excuse for a pig. So, he paid him. Preacher took that pig, stuck it up under his arm. He said, now, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to town and I'm showing everybody the pig I bought from you. <laughs> he said, now, preacher, that's not fair. You know I got a lot of fine, uh, upstanding, uh, a beautiful, well-fed, fat, plump pigs around here. The preacher looked at him and he said, well, what's fair for the church is fair for the pigs. <laughs> what was he talking about? He was talking about this old farmer was judging the church by its poorest people, not by its best folks. Well, listen, you can criticize the church all you want to, but here's what I say. you got to be consistent. If you're going to criticize the church by its weakest wing, you should criticize everything else. By its weakest one. Yeah, this church is not perfect. This church has problems. You're looking at one of its biggest ones right here. Okay? So I'm going to love God's church sacrificially. And secondly, I'm going to love God's church unconditionally. On the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Well, they know not what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Notice here, Jesus loves the church unconditional. So he's died on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Who did he die for? He died for the church. So who's he praying for? Father, forgive them. He's praying for the church. Jesus loves the church unconditional. You know what? When we get it wrong, Jesus still loves this church. When we mess up, Jesus still loves this church. Jesus loves this church unconditionally. So my question is, do you love God's church unconditionally? Do you love this church unconditionally? Or do you love it like the little four-year-old boy loved his mom? One day, he looked in at his mom's eyes and said, Oh, Mom, I love you so much. One of these days, I'm going to grow up and make a bunch of money. And when I do, Mom, I'm going to buy you a fur coat. 
I'm going to buy you a big diamond ring. And I'm going to buy you a Mercedes Benz. Mama just looks at oh honey, that's so sweet. Thank you. Two, three days later, he's misbehaving. She has to sit him down and scold him because of his behavior. And he looks up at her and he says, There goes the bird coat! <laughs> now we laugh about that little boy, but don't you know people do the same thing in the church? Oh, I love the church. I'd do anything for the church until you pick out a color I don't like or you sing a song that I don't like or you do something that You ain't say amen, say oh me. Do you love God's church unconditionally? Let me give you an example of your children. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 45. Again, these are the words of Christ. He will reply, I tell you, whenever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did it not. For me. When you understand when you don't give to the church, when you don't support the church, when you don't attend the church, when you don't serve in the church, you're not doing it to me, you're not doing it to the lay ministers, you're not doing it to the Sunday school teacher, you're doing it to Jesus. He said, when you've not done it to the least, you've done it unto me. See, a lot of folks have a love problem. It's not that they don't love the church. The problem is they don't love Jesus. Because if you love Jesus, you're going to love what He loves. Coming back to the example of your children. Let's just say I'm out there and I run into one of your children and they're naked and they're cold and they're wet and they're hungry and I see them and, and I wrap them up and I take them home and I, I put clothes on them and, and I give them a, a dry place to sleep and I give them something to eat and then I come over to your house and I say to you, do you not love your child? And you say, oh yeah, I love my child. I just don't love them enough to put a roof over their head, table, a food on their table, and clothes on their back. Yeah, I love my child. Let me tell you what I'd say. I'd say, you don't love your child. You're just blowing smoke. And you can say all of these things about loving God and loving the church, but if your actions don't back it up, you're just blowing smoke. In Acts chapter 9, verse 4, he, that's uh, the Apostle Paul, before God changed his name, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. So who was Saul persecuting? The church. But he was persecuting Jesus. Now Jesus is in heaven. Alright, so he's doing these hurtful things to who? To the church. Jesus said, you're doing them to me. Do you understand when you hurt the church, you hurt Jesus? Yeah. When you hurt the church, you hurt Jesus. You say, well, pastor, there's some churches you ought not support. Well, what is the reason to quit church? I'm going to give you three. Number one, when they quit church, when they stop preaching God's Word. We quit preaching God's Word, quit that church. We've been getting uh, proposals and recommendations and quotes and bids for our audio, video, and lighting needs for our new sanctuary. This past Thursday I met with a, uh, with, with a company from Virginia. A guy drove down here four hours just to look over our facilities and make his recommendations. And we're there and he's talking about, he said, he said, God's blessing your church. I said, Amen. He is. We're excited about what God's doing. He said, I was a part of a church. And he said, I was on a, on a mission field with a mission team. And he said, while I was on the mission field, my church voted to ordain practicing homosexuals as pastors. He said, when I got back to the mission field, I turned in my keys and I have never been back. What was he saying? When you stop believing and preaching the Word of God, that's something you can't support. Secondly, quit when they stop trying to win people to Christ. 
See, the whole mission of the church is to tell everybody about Jesus Christ and to plead with people to commit their heart and life to Jesus Christ. I'm not going to call any names. We've got some folks here. God has brought them here. They're doing a great work. They're such a blessing to this church. I thank God for them. But before they ever came, I visited them. And, and here's what the man told me. He said, you know what? The church that I was in, the church that I'd served, it, it was dying on the vine. I went to the pastor. I went to the deacons. I went to the leadership and said, we got to do something. You know what he was told? We just don't want anybody coming to this church. Folks, let me tell you, we want anybody and everybody to come to the house of God to discover the love of Jesus Christ and to commit their heart and life. We want everybody. And then number three, quit when they stop magnifying Jesus. Folks, Anthony Grove Baptist Church is not here to, to magnify a personality or a program or a ministry. We're here to magnify the person of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. To God be the glory. If we lift up Jesus, He's going to draw all people unto Himself. But some folks say, oh preacher, you got, you got a bunch of hypocrites down there at the church. Reminds me of this horse that can count. We've got some folks in here. Y'all have horses. Who who buy horse folks? We've got some right here. All right. Any of y'all? Dale, your, any, can your horse count? I don't think so. Well, this horse here could count. And so they brought him out there in the arena in front of a big crowd. And he asked this horse. The owner asked the horse, said, how much is two plus two? He took his front paw and paw four times. The owner looked at him and he says, how many, ten com how many commandments are there? He took... Five times, five times, ten times, in command. One person in the crowd says, can I ask a question? He said, yeah, go ahead. He said, how many hypocrites are there down at the local Baptist church? They looked out there and the horse was dancing with all four legs. <laughs> the lesson, friend, I'd rather go to the church with the hypocrites than to go to hell with them. That's the only two choices you have you can go to church with them or go to hell with them. Let me tell you something. I wouldn't go to a church that didn't have hypocrites in it. Let me tell you why. That means there's nothing going on. Because see, if something's going on, the devil is going to plant some hypocrites in there. That's just the way it works. Don't you think Russia has some spies in the United States? Don't you think China has some spies? Don't you think the North Koreans and the Iranians are trying to spy on the USA? Well, listen, if this is God's church and God is working, why wouldn't the devil have some hypocrites here? Number one, I'm going to give my loving affection to the church. Number two, your church needs your loyal allegiance. In Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 39, we have a fascinating verse. It says, The people of Israel or to bring their contributions for the sanctuary. And then notice what they said. We will not neglect the house of our God. We will not neglect the house of our God. Now what does the word neglect mean? It means to let go or to leave. Some guy marries his high school sweetheart. They have a couple of children. They've been married for 25 years. And one day he comes in and says, I'm leaving for a woman 20 years younger than you. Let me tell you what that's called. That's called unexcusable. That's called neglect. That's called leaving and letting go. And yet that's what so many people do today when it comes to the church. You know what? The church has been there when, when my kids were born. The church was there when my parents died. The church was there when I had cancer. The church was there. But you know what? I found something better today. And they neglect the house of God. Notice here, I will not neglect God's house. It's what Nehemiah and the Israelites see. I want to share with you seven ways people can neglect God's house. Boy, I do that. I'm going to tell you about this little boy who got sick in mid school. Next day he's in school and his teacher looked at him. And she said, George, did you miss church yesterday? And he looked at her and he said, not one bit. <laughs> not one bit. 
Folks, we have 1,500 church members here. Today, if we have 500 of them show up, we'll have a good Sunday. I want you to know that other 1,000 people, when they're not here, I miss them. Hey, can I be honest with you? They don't miss us. Well, how do people neglect the house of God? In other words, people can neglect to give. Listen, folks, if you don't give, the power bill doesn't get paid. If you don't give, the mortgage doesn't get paid. If you don't give, the literature doesn't get ordered. Number two, I can neglect the worship. Now, you can come without worshiping. I ain't calling any names, but you know what? We're having worship right now. They spoke right out in the hallway. You know why they're out in the hallway? They're not interested in worshiping God. Now, I'm not talking about the people who stay for both services. <laughs> I'm just talking about the people who just show up and be seen. They don't show up to worship. You can neglect the house of God by not growing as a Christian. Not growing as a Christian. Number four, by not fellowshipping with other Christians. You neglect the church. By not serving. So you come every week and all you do is come and soak it up. Bless me! Bless me! But who are you blessing? Who are you serving? What are you doing? By witness. You neglect the house of God by not commending the work of God. And then number seven, you can neglect by simply not attending. This is a tongue twister. I tried to memorize it. It just didn't work. <laughs> so I'm going to read it for you. It seems like this. The church had four members. <coughs> All of them's last name is Bob. So there's four members named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Well, there's an important job needed to be done out at the church. Everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job and everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. And it ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. Next, I will commend and defend my church. If I love my church, I'm going to commend and defend. I love my wife. And I'll commend and defend her till I die. Amen. Luke eleven twenty three. 23. These are the words of Jesus. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. So let me ask you something. Do you love the church? Are you building up the church? If not, Jesus said you're opposed to Him. He says you're working against Him if you're not doing that. So are you for Him or are you against Him? Do you commend and defend the church or you just go along with whoever's talking at the time? You know, this person says, oh, I love my church. You say, oh, I do too. And this little person over here, they do this, this, this. Oh, yes, yeah, hard. I mean, some people are just chameleons. Again, let's be consistent. I read this thing here at the Pastor Quit Sports. It goes like this. Football in the fall, basketball in the winter, baseball in the spring and summer. I'm an avid sports fan, but I have decided I will never watch football, I will never watch basketball, and I'll never watch baseball again. And here are the reasons why. Every time I went to a game, they asked for money. The people with whom I had to sit with weren't friendly and didn't speak to me. The seats were too hard and uncomfortable. I went to lots and lots of games, but the coach never came to visit me. The referee made some decisions that I didn't agree with. 
turned out I sat with a bunch of hypocrites. They didn't come to see the ball games. They just come to see what their friends were wearing. Some games went into overtime and I had to wait in line at the restaurant. At halftime, the band played some songs I'd never heard of. It seems like the games are always scheduled when there was something else I wanted to do. And when I was growing up, my mom and dad, they forced me to go to ball games. And lastly, I recently read a book on sports, and now I feel that I know more than the coaches do. Now, that sounds like a whole lot of the arguments that I hear about why people quit going to church. Just change games instead of church. Just change ball game or team or sports to church. Well, I will commend and defend my church. Second, third, I will not be a church hitchhiker. In Second Samuel 24 and verse 24, but the king answered, No, I will pay you for it. I will not offer to the Lord my God sacrifices that have cost me nothing. And he bought the threshing place and the oxen for 50 pieces of silver. My dad was in the United States Air Force during the Korean War. And wherever he went in America, about half the time, he had to hitchhike. When he was overseas, he'd hitchhike. So when my dad got out of the military, we were right down the road. There's a hitchhiker. My dad picked him up. Because he felt like, hey, there's a lot of folks picked me up as a service man, gave me a ride. And so I grew up thinking it's okay to pick up hitchhikers. Until I was 16 years old. And I picked up a hitchhiker. We got down the road. The guy pulled a gun on me and carjacked me. I hadn't picked up any hitchhikers. <laughs> but you know what I've noticed about hitchhikers? They're glad for you to buy the car. They're glad for you to make the payments. They're glad for you to pay the insurance. They're glad for you to buy the gas. They're glad for you to do the maintenance. They're glad for you to clean up the car. And they will be glad to ride in your car as long as you don't have an accident. And if you have an accident, then they'll sue you. <laughs> folks, I found out there's a whole lot of them kind of folks inside the church. That is, I'll come to the church, but I'm not going to pay for the building. I'm going to come to the church, but I'm not going to pay for the parking lot. I'm going to come to the church, but I'm not going to serve on a committee. I'm not going to serve on a team. I'm not going to struggle with the issues. I'm just going to show up and enjoy all of it as long as what you do I like. And if I don't like it anymore, I'll stick out my thumb and go somewhere else. They don't contribute. They don't work. They don't serve. And yet they say... I love Jesus. Number four, I will not be a unconcerned church member. Psalm 142, verse 4. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Oh, what a sad verse. No man cared for my soul. Folks, 79% of the churches in America are dying. You want me to tell you why? They don't care for souls. Folks are looking around in our uh, society today and saying, who cares about me? Who cares about my soul? I don't know about you, but I love God's church. And if you love God, you love God's church, you've got to love people that are far from God. Okay? You have to love what he loves. I love what F.B. Meyer says. He said, I think what pierces the heart of God more than the wickedness of this world is the indifference of the church. That is, people in the church that just don't care. I got my ticket. I'm going to heaven. Let the rest of the world go to hell. I don't care. I like the way the country bumpkin. You know, sometimes country people say this got a way with words. Oh, country bumpkin said it this way. He said, Preacher, I'd rather chase a rabbit and not catch it as to chase a skunk and catch it. <laughs> what was he saying? Listen, folks, I'd rather try to run and do something great for God and never accomplish it than to run after the things of this world and have everything Everything the world has to offer because in the end, all you got is a skunk. Number 
three. The church needs your lasting attendance. In Hebrews 10, 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Let me ask you something, church. Do you think the Lord's return is drawing near? Huh? Do you think it's drawing near? Then what are we to do? That is not neglect the meeting of together. Okay? So when God's people meet at God's house and God's church to do God's work, where are you going to be? Uh, you're going to be watching 60 Minutes tonight you're going to be in the house of God tonight. Huh? I mean, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be out the lake. You're going to be out on the golf course. When the people of God meet, what are you going to be doing? If you really believe Jesus is coming by, what are you going to do? I want to close by telling you this story. I saved it for the last because if you don't hear a thing I say today, I want you to get this. Dr. Ellis Fuller was a pastor at First Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia, for many years. And then he became the president of Southern Seminary. He tells his story. The pastor was out visiting and visited in a very affluent neighborhood. The couple was evidently well-to-do. They lived in a beautiful mansion. They had exquisite furniture. But the thing that stuck out more than anything else is the whole time the pastor is visiting is how much this couple loved their little dog. This little dog was fed the best steak money could buy. This little dog had its own bedroom. This little dog had its own bed. This little dog was petted and loved and pampered by this couple. And while the pastor's trying to talk to them about the work of God, they kept interrupting him to tell him how much they loved this little dog. And so finally the pastor looks up and says, I don't mean to pry, but you know what? You're a really smart couple, a successful couple. It seems to me like you would have a child to pour all of your love and blessings and affection upon. And the woman burst out crying, jumped up and run out of the room mad. And the pastor looked at the husband and said, what did I say? What did I do? So pastor, you didn't have any way of knowing But me and my wife had a child. We had a son. He was the apple of our eye and the love of our life. And one day he got sick. We took him to the doctor and the doctor said, there's nothing we can do. And our son died. So we tried to have more children. And finally the medical community said, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be able to have any more children. And he looked up and he said, Pastor, I want you to know we really love our son. And the reason that we love this little dog so much is this little dog was our son's dog and he adored this dog and he loved this dog and we love this dog because our son loved this dog. Folks, I want you to know that Jesus Christ died for the church. Jesus Christ loves the church. And if you love Jesus Christ, you're going to love the church because Jesus loves the church. Friend, I want you to know in the last 20 years, I've given this church, this church, the best years of my life. And I want you to know I don't regret any blood, any sweat, any tears, any money, any treasure, any talents as I've ever given because Jesus loves the church and I love Jesus. Amen. And my question today is, you love the church? Do you love this church? Do you love it sacrificially? Do you love it unconditionally? Will you pledge today your loving affection? Will you pledge your loyal allegiance? Will you pledge to God your lasting attendance? Saying, God, as long as this church preaches the Word, as long as this church tries to win the lost, as long as this church magnifies Jesus, I'm going to love it and support it. 
I'll ask you to bow your head. Nobody's looking around. Friend, I'd rather chase a rabbit and not catch it is to chase a skunk and catch it. What are you running after? What are you chasing? Will you join me today in trying to do something great for God? Listen, the church is God's idea. The church is Jesus' bride. It's His body. It's His family. Will you love the church? Will you support the church? I'm wondering who is here today. Who come and say, God, I've just kind of got lackadaisical. I've become mediocre. Lord, I want fresh fire put in my body. Fresh fire in my soul for the things of God. If you're here today and you don't have a church family, you don't have a church home, I want to, I want to encourage you today to get in on the greatest work in eternity. And that's the church. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we have a time of commitment and decision making, Lord, may we decide today, God, we're going to love the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to love His bride. God, we're not going to neglect your house. God, we're going to do whatever we can to be a part of the greatest work in eternity. Lead us now, God, as we make our decisions and our commitments. Make our prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You would please stand as we sing the mighty God.
You may be seated. Brother Ken's going to come to share our prayer concern. I have our closing prayer be dismissed for Sunday school. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate the message this morning. 69 years ago, when I trusted Jesus as my Savior, I gave my life to Him and I gave myself to His church. For 69 years, I've tried to give my allegiance to God's house because I believe the work of God is that that's going to last forever. A couple of things I want to say. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away, he said. And I'd like to, you might have read in your bulletin, but perhaps you missed it, on the 25th of June this month, on Sunday night, the pastor is beginning a study in the book of the Revelation. I'd like to know God's plan for the church now. But I'd like to know something about what's going to happen later, wouldn't you? We have the answers in the Word of God. And I want to ask every member of this church and tell everybody you see that the pastor is going to be going through the book of Revelation, giving this study, starting the 25th, and last Sunday, I believe, of this month, 5 o'clock, every Sunday afternoon. And I personally, as associate pastor, give you a, an invitation to come to be, be a part of this study. Make it a commitment of your life. You'll never regret it if you do so. So please, do that. I'll appreciate it, and you will thank God for it when it's all done. Okay? Several requests of prayer, Brother Perry Adams. We have some more surgery this coming week. We're holding up Perry in our prayers. Ms. Thelma Martin will have some surgery on the 21st. Rachel Thomas will be having some surgery on the 3rd of July. Ms. Helen Padgett has been in the hospital. She's out now, remember? Ms. Padgett, your prayers. Mark Watson has had a kidney stone attack and has been in the hospital this week. Remember Mark? The Trey Newton. As, uh, he fell at work this week and hit his head and he's been having some problems. Had some tests. Remember Trey. As you pray, Alice Eli is waiting for them to call her about surgery. Uh, on her head for a leakage from a surgery that was done back years ago for a brain tumor. And Brother Alice, we pray. We're grateful to see Deandra here this morning. Still pray for her. God might be with Deandra. Help her. I want to remember Sean Reynolds. She was in the hospital this week. I remember Sean DeCamp, Linda Martin, Lady Tate. And God would be these. Brother Tommy Linhart. Was in the hospital. Failed. Let's remember Tom as we pray. Remember the farmer family. God might be with them. They don't live in this town, but they need our prayers. Had one to pass away in that family. Remember them. And then uh, Darla's mother, Roberta Messimer, has not had a good week. We'll remember Ms. Messimer. We see her often. Pray for her that God might help her and that might touch her. If you have a request, please let it be known. All requests on these connection cards will remember. I invite you to pray with me as we pray today. Heavenly Father, first today, I want to say thank you that I am a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I'm not ashamed Take my stand with the church of Jesus Christ because when all else is gone, the church will stand forever because it's built upon Jesus Christ. I pray, God, you'll have every member of this church that is here today that they will again give their undivided love 
and attendance and their, their everything they have are giving to their church. Those who might not be where they ought to be, help them, Lord, to make that vow to God that they will be. And now, Lord, I remember all requests on the hearts of everybody in this building today. You're a God, you're a prayer answering God. God who's always with us. Those requests on the connection cards, we bring them to you. Undertake for them. Lord, continue to keep your hand upon this church and upon our lives. And all you do, folks, we'll praise you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here today.